Yeah. Okay, food response to labor. Basically, anytime there's a break in this chain, that affects the oxygenation to the baby. So how does the baby get oxygen? Placenta. What circulates through that placenta? Blood. Blood. And oxygen is carried in blood, right? So basically, here's mom. And mom inhales oxygen. The oxygen gets carried to the heart and to the vasculature through blood, to the uterus, placenta, and to the cord. And then that's how the baby gets oxygen is via blood, right? What are some things that you think can happen that could break the link in this chain so that baby does not get as much blood, therefore get as much oxygen? Absolutely right. Because right there, so if that happens right there, that break in the chain right there, if the placenta detaches, the baby's not getting blood, therefore the baby's not getting what? Okay. Oxygen, okay? What are some other things that could go on from here to here that would prevent the baby from getting optimal oxygen intake? If mom's not getting oxygen. Right, so what would be example if mom's not getting optimal oxygen? What is she wear asthmatic? What is she wear in sickle cell crisis? What if she smokes? What happens when you smoke? Right. Why, why does it decrease oxygenation? What does nicotine do to the blood vessels? Right. So, therefore, right here, it's decreasing the, the blood supply to the baby. Again, is baby giving as much oxygen? No. Okay. So, you like to say, little baby, help me. This baby is totally dependent on the mom coming into labor with a full suitcase. And what do I mean by that? Basically, the mom, think about your moms in labor. Do you think mom is coming in with a fuller suitcase of oxygen-rich blood if she went to prenatal yoga classes, she attended all her appointments? But what if mom didn't attend any of her appointments? What if she abused coke? What if she had some socio-economical issues, like she was abused at home? Is her suitcase as full as that mom who attended all her childbirth classes, ate organic food, and went to prenatal yoga classes? Yeah. Okay, what is the, you all had your readings in your textbook. What is the normal fetal heart rate during labor for term fetus? 110 to 160. Good job, you're a very good reader, thank you. <laughs> and moderate variability. What, do you all know what that means, variability? Okay, well we have a slide that goes over that. But basically these are the normal ranges. And if there's no late or variable decelerations, decelerations just mean decreases in the heart rate. Uh, early decelerations can be present or can be absent for normal tracing. And these are all in your handouts. Don't feel like you need to write this down. I have all this stuff on the handouts up here, okay? And accelerations can be absent or present. Okay, and again, we talked about some things that would make that break in the chain, make that baby not get as much oxygen. Some things like hypertension. Because what does hypertension do to the mom's vasculature? Does baby get as much oxygen if mom's blood vessels are constricted? What about diabetes? What's the disease process is going on with diabetes? Is mom is getting as much blood, oxygenated blood to the fetus? Okay, or anemia? What is carried on those blood cells? Right, so if mom is anemic and her hemoglobin is low, does she have as much oxygen to give that baby as to if her hemoglobin were 14? Yeah. What is the normal hemoglobin for mom in pregnancy? We don't like it to get below 10, okay? Normally it's about 14 in a non-pregnant mom. We'll see you get um, around 10. We really don't like it to get below 10, okay? And again, if mom has chronic hypertension or any kidney diseases, or uh, all these things can contribute to the mom not getting as much blood to the fetus. Okay, and these are some high-risk conditions that can go on during the mom's uh, pregnancy, whether she has poly, hydramnios, or oligo. Do you all know that what the difference is there? What was polyhydramnios? Too much, much fluid. Yeah, and oligo? Hydramnios? Very good. Vaginal bleeding, because again, if she's losing blood, she's not having as much hemoglobin, she's not having as much oxygen to transport to her fetus. Um, and again, if mom didn't get prenatal care, all these issues can affect the oxygenation status to the fetus. Okay. Anybody know what this thing is called up here on the right? It's a fetal monitor. Have you all been up in the hospital? Okay, fetal monitor. And basically, this fetal monitor, it was invented in the 70s. And basically, this was invented to improve outcomes for the fetuses. They were hoping this would decrease cerebral palsy, 
and there won't be as many C-sections. Well, guess what? Our, have our, has our C-section rate gone up? Yes, indeed. Do we have less cerebral palsy? No. So it really hasn't helped. And why is that? You think, well, we need this great monitor. This should be the you know, perfect solution to help with the fetus. But what is happening is, yes, we have this tool to assess the fetus, but how we're assessing it and, and interpreting it, the tracing, is different from one person to another. And we're not communicating as well. Because I might see something say that's late. You might see something and say it's an early. And therefore, we're not doing the same interventions. We're not doing the appropriate interventions to improve the oxygenation to the fetus. So it really hasn't helped. It basically has kept mothers you know, in bed for their labor um, instead of them moving around. Um, and that's but basically that's when it's come about. So we can monitor the fetus three different ways. We can do intermittent fetal monitoring, which is you can use a fetal scope, um, which we really don't see. Usually, if you see fetal scopes on label units, there's usually dust on it. Um, you should really only use equipment that you're trained in. And so really we don't use the fetal scopes as much. We'll use the dot tone, or some people use the electronic fetal monitor just to listen intermittently, or again, you can use the fetal monitor. For assessing the uterine contractions, you can feel the contractions, okay? And I really encourage you to do that. Don't rely on the monitor. You need to put your hands on the top of the fundus and feel the top of the fundus. And we document the contractions as mild, moderate, or strong if there's an external monitor on. With a mild contraction, I want you all to feel your lip, okay? And that would be a mild contraction. Now feel your nose. That's what a moderate contraction feels like. Now feel your forehead. See how that's really strong? And that's what a, a strong contraction would feel like because the uterus is a muscle. So just like if you were to flex your muscle, go ahead and flex those muscles. Okay, see how that tightens up? Now relax it. See how that's looser now? Okay, and that's what happens with the uterus. During a contraction, it tightens up or it flexes just like you just flexed your bicep. And we assess that flexion to see if it's mild, moderate, or strong. We can also use an internal uterine pressure catheter, or it's abbreviated IUPC. And when an IUPC is in place, we can determine in millimeters of mercury how strong those contractions really are in millimeters of mercury. So we can use a numerical value to assess the strength of the contraction. But we can only do that when an internal uterine pressure catheter is in. Okay. Okay. This is just an example of fetal scope. Again, um, if you do see these on the nursing units when you're at CMC, it's probably got dust on it. They just start used. The nurses, uh, newer nurses, are not really trained in this. So that, but that's what they used to use back in the day. Um, I think I used this maybe ten times when I started nursing in '88. Uh, the dot tone is very popular. It basically works through sound waves, just like an ultrasound, and it picks up the heart rate that way. And you have to listen. And um, those are, are what you see more often for intermittent and moderate uh, The fetal monitor on the mom's belly, this is the fetal monitor. And this is the uterine monitor. The uterine monitor has this little sensor in the center, and it actually picks up that tightening, that flexing of the contractions. Okay? Now, these aren't necessarily always the places where they are at. What if you have the baby that's breech? That fetal monitor might be lower. Basically, you're putting it over the back of the baby's heart the babies, most babies are head first, yes, in the ideal world. And so usually you're putting it in the, um, where the baby's heart rate heart rate would be and putting it, uh, it's picking up um, that way. And so right for this particular mom, that's where the heart rate is, but it might be somewhere lower. Or if you have a preterm mom, it might be lower because their fundus is not at the height as a term fetus, okay? And then of course the uterine contraction. And I discourage you from putting these really tight. Sometimes I'll go in there. Um, as, as a preceptor, I'll go in there when I'm with their students, and I'll see they're having knotted in them and they're really tight. Really, if you have accurate placement, you don't have to have the belts on that tight. Think about comfort. Some of these women are in labor for 12 to 24 hours. Think about having that on for that long and that tight. Okay, the fetal monitor, uh, electronic fetal monitors, abbreviated EFM, and it's a device that records the fetal heart rate, and it also will record the contraction and it prints out on paper. It also is stored electronically. Um, so you can either store the paper, or you can store the, uh, just store it electronically. Back in the day, um, before we had electronic medical record, we used to store the paper, and it would go to a warehouse and be stored forever, but now they're getting away from actually keeping it on paper. Unless there is a bad outcome, they'll keep the paper tracing for teaching purposes. 
but for the most part they're storing the electronic fetal tracing electronically. Okay, so when it prints out on the paper or displays on the monitor screen, this is what it looks like. And I apologize, this is not color so you can see it, but basically it's divided into two sections. The top part is the fetal heart rate and the bottom part is the uterine contractions. This top part is these little boxes here represent 10 beats per minute. So what did I say the average heart rate was for a fetus? 110 to 160. So right here is 110 and here's 160. So this would be the normal range the fetal heart rate would be. From here to here, these little boxes represent 10 seconds, okay? And these darker lines represent one minute. So we can look at this and see what the baby's heart rate is. For the contractions, um, we count from start of contraction to start of contraction, okay? Again, each box is 10 seconds, and the darker lines represent one minute. So see how they have numbers here? Even though they have the numbers here, and you will see the contraction graph that go down, if it's an external uterine contraction monitor, we do not go by the numbers. We have to go by what? Oh, it's oh, right, palpate. This is palpate. Okay, so you have to go by palpate. So even though with an ex external monitor, yes, you'll see the number go up to say 40 or 50, but we don't go by that number. We do not record that number unless it's internal uterine pressure catheter. Okay, and then we can record <coughs> this. And this measurement is millimeters per mercury. This is beats per minute. And on Thursday, when I'm here, we're going to go over some tracings. And you actually all have actual tracings here that you can see how that displays. And the uterine contraction, you have your top, the peak of the contraction. And then you have where the contraction starts to build up and where it starts to come down. And when we count contractions, we count contractions from the start of one contraction to the start of another. Now, usually, it's, it's really fun. If, when you're in labor, I encourage you to feel this. Okay, put your hands on that mom's belly. Do not be afraid. What's really interesting when you do that, without looking at the monitor, maybe have your back away from the monitor, have your hands on the mom's belly, and you actually, with your fingertips, and really focus on using your ring finger, because your index finger has more calluses on it, use it more, but your ring finger is, I think, the most sensitive. You don't use that to push numbers on the phone or, or push an elevator, do you? You usually use your index finger. So put your hands on the fundus. And you usually will feel that uterus tighten first. And look at the mom's facial expression. And then when the contraction gets right about here, mom will start to feel the contraction. And then you can really feel it strong at the peak or the acne of the contraction. And then about here, mom will start smiling again. Well, you'll still feel it. But then about here, you won't feel it anymore with your hands. So really, I encourage you to put your hands on that, on that belly and feel those contractions, OK? And this is just, again, where how it looks up compared and how it gets connected to the monitor, and then it prints out on the tracing. OK, if you don't have any terminology, I really encourage you to use the appropriate terminology in this article that I have up here. There's the NICHD guidelines. And basically, what, what does this mean? Well, have you all heard of the Joint Commission? Mm -hmm. Does it just make you like the Joint Commission? You hear that word, it's just like, ooh, bad. I, I don't want to be a clinical that day. But basically, um, and I'm sure you've heard the um, To Err is Human from the Institute of Medicine. Basically, it all started from the Institute of Medicine said, hey, we are making mistakes in hospitals, we're making infections, we're killing people, we have to do a better job. So the Joint Commission got a hold of this and they said, you know what, you're right. We need to make some national patient safety goals to improve the outcomes of patients. And then as a result of that, the OB world got together and said, you know what, you're right, because the Joint Commission says that we are, there's a sentinel events going on, and they found that the biggest part of these sentinel events, the biggest cause, is communication. And if we don't, as healthcare providers, communicate when interpreting these tracings, we may not be doing the appropriate interventions. So they decide, you know what, we really, doctors, midwives, nurses, we need to get on the same page and use the terminology. So they all sat down together in the late, in the late 90s, and guess what happened? They didn't really agree on the terminology. They could agree on some of it, but not all of it. But they did agree on some terminology that we're going to use here in the next slides. And that's the terminology we really encourage you to use. Because when you take someone's pulse, and the doctor or midwife or PA says, what was the pulse? Do you say, well, I put my two fingers on the patient's outside wrist, and I felt for six seconds, and then I multiplied that by 10, and I got 82. Is that what you say when they ask for a pulse? No, you're educated. You say the pulse is 82. 